This is a lecture on ethical egoism, okay, or moral egoism. It's for the intro ethics and the moral issues classes. Um, as always, we are concerned with the real world uh, benefits or limitations of the theory as regards making real life ethical decisions. The purely theoretical virtues or vices of a position are of concern to us only in so far as they have real world consequences. Uh, I believe that that is, the, that is the agenda, if you will, of Socrates as well. All these things that, that we discuss, he said on various occasions, only matter if they help to illuminate the question of how we ought to live our lives. And indeed, one way they can illuminate that is by refuting and disposing of uh, unsatisfactory answers. Well, very well. Ethical egoism has always been around since the ancient Greeks. Most of what we're discussing has been around since at least the ancient Greeks in one form or another. It's become quite popular in, in the late 20th century, mid to late 20th century, and in fact whole political agendas are based upon the idea that ethical egoism is uh, not only satisfactory, but in fact is the only satisfactory approach to ethics. So it's, it certainly has real world consequences and it certainly is uh, important to discuss. Um, we want to distinguish between two kinds of egoism to begin with. Psychological egoism, and this is, this is outlined on your study guide, psychological egoism and ethical egoism. Psychological egoism is a descriptive theory, and as we discussed before, a descriptive theory is an attempt to tell you what the facts are, whereas a prescriptive theory attempts to tell you what you ought to do. Psychological egoism is the uh, position that human beings are only motivated by self-interest. Okay? A moderate form of psychological egoism would say that we always have our own self-interest in mind, whatever else might be motivating us. A uh, more radical form of, of psychological egoism would say that we are never motivated by anything else. Indeed, most of the people who want to apply uh, egoism to political or, uh, or ethical theories are taking the stronger position that it is at root the only thing that motivates us. Ethical egoism is a prescriptive theory. It tells us that we, in fact, ought to only be concerned with our own self-interest and nothing else. All right, well, Richard Dawkins, a noted uh, genetic scientist and uh, outspoken atheist, chuckled about Ayn Rand's novel, The Virtue of Selfishness, saying, Really, if you're a psychological egoist, which Rand is, isn't ethical egoism superfluous? If people are not able to act other than selfishly, why do you write a book admonishing them to be selfish? They're going to do that anyway. I think the short answer is to, of course, sell books. But uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about Rand in more detail later. Um, Psychological egoism is not capable of entailing ethical egoism because of what's called the is-ought problem, which we've mentioned before. You can't derive a, a normative conclusion from purely factual premises in an argument. Okay? I cannot have nothing but alleged facts in my premise, the premises of an argument and then draw a conclusion that contains a value judgment. The reason being, uh, it's unconnected. I've introduced a property that I've not connected to anything else that I've said. Let me give you a let me give you an example. Supposing I say all people are mortal. Socrates is a person, therefore Socrates is mortal. Okay. I'm saying here's a fact. Here's a fact. If those two facts are true, then this conclusion's got to be true. Now, supposing I say Socrates is a person. All people are selfish, therefore Socrates is selfish. Again, that's I'm, I'm alleging facts, okay? I'm trying to draw a factual conclusion from allegedly factual premises. But supposing I say, all people are selfish, 
Socrates is a person, therefore Socrates is wise. Where did this, where did the property of wisdom come from? I just tossed it in at the end. I haven't connected it to anything in the premises. That's not how an argument works. Okay. David Hume, again, was, there's that name again. David Hume was uh, the first person to point out very clearly uh, what he, what is sometimes called the fact value gap or the is ought problem. You can't derive a value judgment from purely factual premises. You have to have you have to have a value judgment somewhere in your premises to derive a, a conclusion that is a value judgment. Okay, so psychological egoism can't lead to ethical egoism logically. It's logically unrelated. Now there is this what's known as the um, ought implies can principle, which is associated usually with the writings of Immanuel Kant. That if I say I ought to do something, that implies that I can do it because I can't have a duty to do something that's impossible for me to do. That sounds pretty straightforward, right? If it's impossible for me to do it, it can't be my duty to do it. Now, I, I, I would submit that saying that people are by nature incapable of being uh, of being other than selfish does not imply that they don't have a duty to do otherwise, as we'll find in various forms of theological ethics that say, you know, you have a duty to, to do this, but because of your fallen nature, because of your human weakness, you're incapable of doing your moral or theological duty, and that's why you need divine assistance. You can't do it on your own. Okay, so it's it is possible, it is possible that we could say we are by nature selfish, but we ought not to be. And it, that, isn't, that isn't nonsensical. Okay. Um, the big problem for psychological egoism comes straight off. It, it's no, it takes no trick to provide counterexamples. People appear to do things out of concern for others every day. Okay. Um, the psychological egoist would say, well, you see, the, the, the operative term there is appear. When it appears I'm doing something out of concern for you, I'm actually only doing it for my own happiness or satisfaction. Really? What about uh, those stories that have come out of every modern war about, they run something like this, a hand grenade rolls into a barracks or into a, a bunker or into a, a foxhole or a trench. There's no time to grab it and throw it clear but one soldier throws his body over the grenade and absorbs the explosion. Now, he knows he's going to be killed doing it, but he saves the lives of his comrades. Now, people say, well, but he's trained to do that. Yes, he is. But on the other hand, you could defy your training and say, yeah, I was trained. I was trained to do this. I'm just going to grab somebody else and throw him on top of it. Um, very difficult. Well, yeah, but but I'll, th I'll be a hero. Yeah, well, you won't be around to appreciate the benefits of being a hero, but I'll have great satisfaction knowing I saved the lives of my comrades. Excuse me, but if psychological egoism is correct, why would I have more satisfaction saving the lives of my comrades than I would just saving my own life? That would seem to say that psychological egoism uh, is in fact false. Um, I like to ask my classes, do you care about yourself? Pretty much everybody will raise their hands. Do you care about at least one other person? Pretty much everybody raises their hands. Okay, so caring about yourself and caring about others are not incompatible, and you are living proof of that. Hmm, they ponder. Okay, there's the wonderful story about Abraham Lincoln that appears in almost every discussion of psychological egoism, and it does appear in Sturba's book. Although Sturba, I think, does not is not sufficiently clear in um, in let's say distilling the philosophically important points of, of that example. Lincoln was, as the story goes, in his carriage. Uh, he was having a debate. Lincoln was a very intelligent man. He he enjoyed playing devil's advocate in arguments just for the sake of you know. Of carrying on the argument, you know, unpacking and clarifying and exploring the possibilities. Well, he was talking with a member of his cabinet, and Lincoln was claiming, 
was basically taking the position of a psychological egoist and saying, well, I think everyone is selfishly motivated. Okay, everyone is motivated only by concern for themselves. And his cabinet member was trying to was trying to argue against that. They were having a, an interesting discussion when suddenly they heard a terrible squealing. In Lincoln ordered his carriage stopped on a bridge and uh, it was raining. The river was raging underneath, being fed by the rain. Lincoln got out and saw that there were piglets trapped underneath the bridge and they were gonna drown. So Lincoln climbed down under the bridge, got himself all wet, all muddy, rescued the piglets, got them up on shore safely. Soaking wet and muddy, he got back into his carriage and his uh, cabinet member was laughing, saying, Abe, your actions just refuted everything you were arguing for. And Lincoln, who was very fond of very dry humor, said, why no, that was, that was selfish concern, uh, pure and simple. If I hadn't rescued those piglets, my conscience would have bothered me something terrible. Well, you, you may not get the irony there. <laughs> Let me, don't, want, don't want to belabor the point, but the point is, if psychological egoism were true, there is no reason why Lincoln's conscience would have bothered him. Why would he have cared about the piglets to begin with? If we don't care about others, even other human beings, why would, why would his conscience bother him for not rescuing the piglets? If psychological egoism were true, Lincoln would have said, tough luck for the piglets or for their owner, or for their, their mother or whatever. But it's not in my interest to get soaked in order to, uh, in order to rescue them. So you see, that actually is a counterexample. Um, now, it's a counterexample that is valuable because it also shows the, the completely, completely fallacious way in which ethical ego or psychological egoists tr sometimes try to dispense with counterexamples. Well, you see, if I am loving and kind and generous to you, it's because that's what I want to do. So you see, I'm just doing what I want to do. So I'm only motivated by what I want to do. Really? Is that the crucial consideration? Now, I'll refer to Aristotle because uh, Rand and others like to refer to Aristotle, uh, taking him out of context. Aristotle held that love and friendship were absolutely crucial to, uh, to personal satisfaction, to moral behavior, moral relationships, to good familial relationships, community, political relationships. As I discussed in the, the, lecture on, uh, the lecture on the concept of love, philia, philia. Okay, philia is defined by its intent. Ask for the motive and the object. That's what describes philia. Love is not a, a matter of what the outcome is going to be. It's a matter of what I intend. If I am honestly motivated by a concern for the well-being of others, that's exactly that's exactly what the uh, critic of psychological egoism is saying is possible. Admitting that it's possible, but then saying, oh, but you see, that's just another instance of selfishness. You've taken the notion of selfishness and you've made it so ambiguous that it now actually includes its opposite. It, when philosophy, we call that a, uh, a distinction without a difference. There's a problem in modern philosophy called, that sometimes you call the demarcation problem. This is particularly, particularly important in philosophy of, uh, philosophy of science, but it has general applicability to other fields as well, to, uh, for instance, here. If I'm going to say the world is this way rather than this way, I should not be able to go looking for evidence that it's this way and find that evidence. I should be able to say if what I'm asserting is true, then this is the evidence that would prove it false. If I can't say what my description of reality would, would, what would falsify that, then in fact, I haven't said anything. What I'm saying is so vague, it's compatible with every possible state of affairs, in which case I've not said anything. Okay, so that's the demarcation problem. And this is exactly the uh, sleight of hands that's going on and telling Lincoln, and Lincoln making the joke 
about, well, that was just self-interest, pure and simple. Or people saying, well, you know, it's I get a satisfaction out of helping others, so I'm just acting for my own satisfaction. Yeah, that's isn't that exactly what uh, what the two different positions have said? Some people get satisfaction only through their own selfish interest, and others actually find a part of their satisfaction comes from love and friendship and reciprocal generosity, or even unreciprocated generosity. Okay. Um, well, so either you have obvious counterexamples that refute psychological egoism, or you make the claim of psychological egoism so vague that it doesn't say anything at all, so that you can get rid of the counterexamples. Well, for these reasons, psychological egoism is pretty much tossed on the dustbin by most philosophers. It's simply, this is, a, this is an explanation that did not provide an explanation. This is an explanation that failed. That, uh, however, leaves ethical egoism untouched. Because, in fact, there's no, as, as Dawkins pointed out, there's no reason to admonish people to follow only their self-interest if, in fact, they're incapable of doing anything else. Okay, So the prescriptive problem remains even if the descriptive theory is, is not workable. Now, we're going to look at two... Uh, Two figures who loom large in ethical egoism, uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, I'm referencing his work De Siva. Uh, Hobbes is basically doing armchair anthropology. He's not rigorously arguing for anything that he says. He rather sort of taking the, taking the position that any intellectually honest person is going to acknowledge that what I'm saying is true. Okay. Um, it's interesting. I've read a number of nonfiction works from about the time that Hobbes was writing, and I believe it is historically the case that most of the people who were writing nonfiction at the time for a general audience were clergymen, and so a lot of those works actually have the form of a uh, an extended sermon. <laughs> now, I don't know if you attend church, if you listen to sermons. Um, my own feeling is that, uh, you know, if, there is, if there's no question and answer period afterward, if I'm just supposed to listen to what one person's telling me and say, well, that's got to be the case and I can't question it and I'm not going to do any more reading, I'm not going to do any more investigation, and I can't defend a contrary position, then what good is that for me? Okay? you got to be preaching to the choir, so to speak, and talking to people who already believe what you believe for that too be any of any value, and that would be value only for encouragement rather than for actually enlightening me about anything. Okay, well, Hobbes says, let's say armchair anthropology. Let me just backtrack a second. Armchair anthropology, when I say armchair followed by the name of any science, means that this is not based on going out and gathering evidence, doing measurements, peer review, you know, designing experiments, this sort of thing. It's not based on anything that we normally associate with, with science. Rather, it's based on sitting back in your armchair and saying, now, I think, according to my reasoning, this is how it must be. Okay. The medievals did a great deal of armchair physics, and pretty much all of it was wrong. Okay. As soon as people started checking things out, doing experiments, taking careful measurements, Remembering Plato's admonition that uh, mathematics is the language of nature. <laughs> um, at that point, we started seeing that much of what they said was untenable. If there was any evidence for it, it at least was not the best evidenced uh, explanation of how the physical world worked. Okay, so Hobbes is doing not armchair physics, but armchair anthropology. Okay. Anecdotal evidence is generally not accepted by any anyone outside of a, uh, let's say, a blog, <laughs> where people people say, "Well, look, I just I, I just know all about this because I'm a smart person and charismatic and blah 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 blah." And they offer no evidence, no experiments, no data, no measurement, nothing. Okay. 
we're in the middle of a basically a pandemic lockdown because of the coronavirus and uh, people have observed, you know, for all of these sort of flighty, magical thinking approaches to health and medicine, as soon as our lives were threatened on a large scale, you people really came running frantically back to science, didn't you? For the most part, that's true. It's not, even then, it's not universally true. But, okay, the limits of armchair science, okay, or of Facebook blogging science, which is not to say that legitimate scientists don't sometimes have blogs or use Facebook. Okay, well, what does Hobbes actually say? He says, we do not naturally love one another. Now, all kinds of social scientists would say that's not true. We're hardwired to form bonded pairs. At the least, we're hardwired to care about our own children, to form interpersonal bonds. That's part of our chemistry, part of our neurology. Um, it's just not true that we don't naturally love one another. We do not, says Hobbes, seek the company of others for its own sake. Really? Again, the consensus of scientists today would be, no, we're a social animal. We are hardwired to be a social animal. Of course, we seek the company of others for its own sake. Of course, it's, it's more satisfying to feel connected than it is to feel utterly isolated. The natural state of humanity is the war of all against all. Really? Am I at war with my own child? With my own spouse? With my own friends? The war of everyone against everyone? Now, Hobbes, when he says the natural state, is very, very vague about what that actually means. Well, prior to civilization, well, wait, what are you counting as civilization? If we are a social animal, we have from the earliest days always lived in groups. Groups will always have customs, norms. Eventually, they'll formalize those into rules. What exactly is this mythical state of nature? It almost sounds like a Garden of Eden myth. Once upon a time, before we fell and formed societies, this is how we were, only it wasn't idyllic. It was red in claw and tooth. Okay. In the state of nature, human life is nasty, brutish, and short. Again, what is the state of nature he's referring to? Neanderthal man? We have, we have absolutely good evidence that it wasn't necessarily nasty, brutish, and short for the Neanderthals. It's a story about uh, Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, being asked. <clears throat> I've, tried to, I've tried to run this down to see if it's true. It's instructive, even if it's only a parable. Okay? She was asked by a student, what was the first sign of civilization? that we have found in the historic record, in the archeological or paleontological record? What is the first sign of actual civilization? And he expected it would be something about writing or art or tools or whatever. And she said, this broken femur, you know what a femur is, a bone? This femur was broken and then we can tell it healed. Whoever had this broken femur would not have been able to hunt or gather for himself, would not have been able to really do any crucial work for the community, but he lived long enough for his, for his femur to heal and for him to apparently resume normal life with, a, you know, with that healed femur. Why is that the first sign of civilization? Other members of his group had to be taking care of him. He could not have survived if others were not taking care of him. And according to me, that is the first sign of civilization is that we are in groups where we take care of one another. It's not just everyone for everyone for themselves and the war of everybody against everybody. Well, you broke your leg. Tough. Maybe we can use you for bait. It wasn't like that. Okay. I once, I, I have to share, I once was covering this material a long time ago in, in class, and I, I, I said that phrase, according to Hobbes, in a state of nature, human life is nasty, brutish, and short. And a woman said, 
That sounds just like my ex. Nasty, brutish, and short. Oh, well. Um, we form a temporary truce for our own benefit. I realize that if we have rules that say, you can't kill me and in return I can't kill you, you can't steal from me and in return I can't steal from you, then I realize at some point I'm going to be better off for having that rule. And so I'm willing to reciprocate and make those rules. That's the origin of the social contract, a truce in this war of everybody against everybody. Well, what truce did I declare with my children who can't survive without me? What truce did I declare for the person who had the broken femur? If I ever break my femur, you'll take care of me? Probably that is understood. But the notion that there's a truce is the notion that we were at war to begin with, rather than that we were a bonded group. Now, will there be conflicts? Will there be competition? Certainly, but will there also be cooperation? Well, again, uh, scientists today would say, yeah, we're hardwired for cooperation. We've been hardwired for cooperation uh, since at least the Stone Age. And the fact that we were able to live in cooperative groups the way we were, is a very important reason why we have survived. Okay. Some notes about uh, about Hobbes. First of all, this is the Izot problem in um, absolutely in spades. Okay. We are this way. We are this way. We are this way. We are this way. Therefore, we ought only to be motivated by selfish concern. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, you can't derive a value, you can't logically derive a value judgment from purely factual premises. You could always say, we are this way, we are this way, we are this way. We would be better off if we changed some of that. Okay. Um, I also want to introduce what's called the naturalistic fallacy. Now, you remember the open question argument that G.E. Moore talked about. Okay. X is good, here's an example, X is good can't simply mean I like X, because I can, without contradicting myself, say I like X, but X is morally wrong. Or X is my moral duty, but I really don't like it. And I gave examples of that. If you go back to the uh, ethical relativism lecture. Well, naturalistic fallacy is a more general principle that says whenever you try to substitute the names of some natural properties for the term good, you're going to have that same problem. Okay? Um, it's not just here are some examples of theories that crash on the open question argument. You're going to have a similar problem if you try to substitute the name of any natural property or set of natural properties for good and say that's the definition of good. The best you can do is to do, say, what John Stuart Mill did and say, here's the test of whether this is good, not the definition of good. Well, what exactly is Hobbes trying to establish? That if we are a certain way, then that's the way we ought to be? I mean, a lot of people use uh, a sort of a vague idea of, a vague notion of self-acceptance to justify, well, that's just how I am. You, know, you keep slapping your sister. Well, that's just how I am. No, you need to, you need to not be that way. Well, I'm just how I am. That's just me. No, look, these are things you're choosing to do. And you may be choosing to do because you don't know how to manage your anger or because you don't actually realize that you're choosing to do these things. Right, this is an important point of some forms of psychotherapy. It's an important point of, uh, of certain Buddhist teachings that when you realize your feelings aren't just happening to you, they are actually something you're doing through responses that if an, even, if, uh, even if habitual can be made voluntary and can be changed, then in fact you can change them. Okay, so basically, He's got no argument here. <laughs> Hobbes is an interesting figure. He's, his, his politics has become much more, uh, much more admired 
in recent times, he was very much the, you know, if you will, the poster boy of patriarchal ethics. Top down, we talked about this before when we talked about the expanding circle, top down patriarchal ethics. For this reason, he thought that monarchy was the best form of government. Why? Well, just to give a quick review, we have this social contract, which for Hobbes is just a series of truces about uh, and for self-protection. It's clearly, if I'm only selfishly motivated, it's going to be in my interest to try to get everybody else to follow those rules and then break them myself whenever I can get away with it. So what we need is accountability. Ah, there's that word again. We keep coming back to that. Perhaps a, an integral part of ethics is people have to be accountable. So in order to be accountable, somebody has to have an absolute right to smack you down if you break the rules. We give that right to the king, which he delegates to his minions. Okay. Uh, because the king has an absolute right to smack you down, you are always going to be accountable to someone if you live lawlessly. Now, if we empower people at the top to be able to smack us down when we don't behave as they tell us we ought to, how long will it take before they start making rules purely for their own self-interest, for their own benefit, with no regard for whether it's going to be any good for us? Well, they'll start doing that immediately. How long will it take before they start abusing their power? Well, they'll start doing that immediately. It's perhaps a, uh, perhaps a lesson to be learned about modern politics. If you make anyone unaccountable, put them above the law and say that they are not accountable to the law, then essentially that person cannot be held, who cannot be held accountable, will be capable of doing anything because there will be no negative repercussions ever. So, okay, I think most historians would say Hobbes, when Hobbes says, look, that's the price we pay so that we don't have armed brigands kicking down our door in the middle of the night and killing us because they're afraid of the king too. Uh, I think most historians would say he is underestimating the danger that it will in fact be the minions of the king who are kicking in our door in the middle of the night to kill us. Okay. This is, again, we talked about, when we talked about the credo, about the importance of rule by law. And we talked a little bit about Confucius, uh, Confucius, the, the notion of Confucius, that uh, empathy, respect, reciprocity, accountability. Then civilization is possible. Okay, so things to think about. Let's move on to Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand basically... Uh, is rewarming Hobbes and representing Hobbes. Um, there are those who, she thought of herself as a philosopher. There are those who think of her as less a philosopher than a polemicist. Uh, I have to admit, I am of, of that camp. I've looked at what she calls philosophy and it seemed to me it just really doesn't pass muster to be, to be called philosophy. Um, she tends to take arguments out of context uh, it's arguable she misrepresents them. She only just incorporates them toward her own end. Um, well, there's nothing wrong with being a polemicist, okay? A polemic is a writing that is not meant to give a fair hearing to all sides. It's rather meant to persuade you of a point of view. Uh, some polemics are, are not bad at all. For instance, uh, um, Thomas Paine's Common Sense was a polemic. And it's one of the one of the documents that helped persuade vast numbers of Americans that we needed to have independence from Britain. Paine did not say, let's weigh the pros and cons. No, he said, no, we need independence and here's why. And let me pers pers give you the most persuasive argument I can think of. Now that has its place. The problem being, of course, that if you can do a polemic for opposite sides, that leaves you not knowing uh, exactly what you actually should do. At some point, you have to be more of a philosopher and say, well, you know, let's, let's look at what reasons, what arguments exist for this view and for alternative points of view, and okay, what criticisms exist for both. 
So, Rand's major nonfiction work is called The Virtue of Selfishness. Um, virtue, okay. She contends that she is, in fact, like Aristotle, a virtue ethicist. Virtue ethics we've only noted uh, marginally a few times throughout the course because the limits of one course, you can only do so much. Virtue ethics basically aims toward getting you to be a certain kind of person, a person who embodies virtues. Of course, you then have the problem of figuring out what virtues you ought to embody. To oversimplify things a bit, Aristotle said, well, you know, we've spent too much time in philosophy you know, arguing about what is virtue, and we ought to spend more time figuring out how to actually make people virtuous. Mm, do you see a danger there? If we don't spend the time figuring out what virtue is, but only how to just inculcate certain character traits, how do we know that we're not inculcating vices? You know, people who have deeply racist or deeply misogynist or deeply, deeply uh, let's say, bias-based, hateful values will try to impart those to their children. will think they've done a good job of making their children virtuous if their children echo those hate-based beliefs. Okay. Um, there's an old film uh, called Betrayed or Betrayal or something. So I'm not... I'm not concerned to properly identify it because it's not such a good film that you should run right out and try to find a copy. But an interesting part of it is that uh, this, this very issue, um, the main character is a FBI agent who poses as a country girl who's trying to infiltrate a white supremacist group. Uh, the FBI believes they may be terrorists. She thinks, you know, whatever they are, they're, they're not really terrorists. They're not a danger to anybody. At one point, she, she cozies into the affections of one of the leaders of the white supremacist group, and she's babysitting for the kids. A little five-year-old daughter is lying there in bed, getting having been tucked in, and is rattling on. You know, if you ever babysat or if you ever had a, a five-year-old, you know, they'll, uh, just before they go to sleep, sometimes rattle off everything and anything in their brains, connected with an endless succession of and. Like, and then she did this, and then and I, I was thinking of this, and then and then maybe we could have oatmeal for breakfast, and, and then maybe we could play basketball tomorrow, and then maybe we, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so she's going on like that, and she turns and she, she and she's just going on like a little kid and then she says and and and, and you know what one day we're going to kill all the niggers and all the kikes and then everything's going to be beautiful and the the undercover fbi agent looks like she's going to throw up like oh my god this came out of the mouth of a five-year-old girl this is what she's being taught by her father okay so yeah maybe we do actually need to ask whether the whether the values being uh, that are widespread in our own tribe are the ones we really should be passing on to our kids. But, okay, virtue ethics. I should look at what kind of person I'm going to be. I would contend that one of the, I'm not alone in this, I would contend that one of the uh, weaknesses of virtue ethics, that virtue ethics approach, is that you really can't adequately describe what kind of person I am, whether I am wise, just, benevolent, fair, etc., etc., without looking at my actual relationships with real human beings. And in that case, at some point, this whole concern about what kind of person I am dissolves into, the, into a concern about, you know, how should I be treating others? How should I be living my life? It may just be two different ways of looking at exactly the same sets of issues, but I don't think that the one can be dissolved into the other. So, Rand says altruism is self-hatred. Altruism means that you are concerned for the well-being of others and not at all for your own. That's what she says, okay? Selfishness is simply self-love. Selfishness simply means you love yourself. Okay, now I'm going to suggest that this is what's known as the definest fallacy. You take a word, 
you assign a different meaning to it from what it actually has, and then you derive conclusions from that special definition and then say, well, you see, now I, I've, I've proven something about the way that it's usually used. Okay, I, For instance, altruism, Rand falsely says, just look it up in the dictionary. If you look it up in the dictionary, any major dictionary of the English language, you're going to find out that she's wrong. Uh, altruism means that you are motivated by a concern for the well-being of others. Okay, again, think about this. Do you care about yourself? Do you also care about even one other person? So loving someone else and loving yourself as well are not incompatible. Okay, and we talked about, that's why we began with the lecture on the ancient Greek idea of eros, agape, and philia. These things can be put into balance, and that's traditionally been the whole idea of, of morality, is that we have to bring these things into balance. Altruism is not self-hate. It's not, I don't deserve to be happy. I don't deserve anything good. I should give away everything, even at the, even at the cost of crippling my own life. No. It's defined, not only in philosophy, but in the social sciences as well, as having as its intent or its motive or its object the good of someone else. Okay? If I cook a, a lovely dinner for my wife and I, and it's stuff that I know she likes and stuff that I know that I like, Am I doing it for her benefit? Yeah. Am I also doing it simultaneously for my own benefit? Yeah, we're both gonna benefit from it. There's nothing paradoxical about that. I'm gonna do something we both enjoy. Let's watch a movie. Well, I like this one. Yeah, but I, I don't really like that movie. Okay, well, what about this one? No, I don't really like that one. Well, is there a movie we both like? Oh yeah, I like this. Oh yeah, I like that too. Okay, well, we'll watch this one that we both like. Hey. Compromises. Morality involves compromises. Not simply, I'm going to uh, I'm going to ruthlessly try to enforce my own interest with no consideration for the interest of others. Selfishness means that you are concerned for your own interest to the exclusion of concern for the interest of anyone else. Selfishness and self-interest are not synonyms. The one does not imply the other and they are not synonyms. That is what's known as an equivocation fallacy, as well as being a definist fallacy. Okay, that is what you change in mid-argument, you change the meaning of a word. Okay. Um, it's just simply, it's just simply a, 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 a car wreck of, of informal fallacies. Uh, I can love others and love myself. And in fact, sometimes I can do both simultaneously. And sometimes in doing both simultaneously and having them in balance, I'm going to be better off than I was if I was only concerned for myself. Okay. So, altruism is compatible with self-interest because self-interest is not a synonym with selfish. And if you keep that in mind, essentially Rand's entire argument collapses. To care about myself does not require that I don't care about you. To care about you does not require that I don't care about myself. Okay. Rand was an avowed atheist. This is interesting. Uh, Paul Ryan, a retired, uh, retired member of Congress, required that anyone joining his staff had to read certain novels by Ayn Rand. And he once publicly said, uh, I think it was a couple of years before he retired, he said, I agree with everything Rand said, except for her atheism. What he didn't get was that if, if you don't endorse the atheism, none of the rest of it holds. Jesus said that there are, well, that's, uh, this is for him, you know, there, there are no serious, no serious religious uh, options except for Christianity. So let's, let's just take Christianity for an example. Jesus said uh, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. 
well, that's that's totally totally repugnant to Ayn Rand. I'm under no obligation to love my neighbor, let alone to love my neighbor as much as I love myself. In fact, it's immoral to do so. Okay. You know, Jesus said you can't serve two masters. Okay. You you can't you can't serve both worldly values, which he would identify with selfish motives. I want more, I don't care how I get it and divine or theological values which say we should love one another treat each other like brothers and sisters we should uh, we should take care of the poor we should take care of the infirm Rand thinks that that is slavery i've actually heard people quote that if you take my tax money and use it to take care of someone who can't take care of himself that's slavery you're making me his slave because you're without my consent taking my money to take care of him how about it's part of the social contract? You're not a slave. You are a party to a social contract. And you get all kinds of benefits, but you also have all kinds of obligations. Okay. Um, paradoxes of selfishness and altruism. Um, Peter Singer, when we, read, when we read Peter Singer's book, How Are We to Live? We'll find a, we'll find a number of these. Uh, Paradox is being pointed out. Let's say two early humans, I think he says Neanderthal man, but I think he's got them in the wrong place in time to meet a saber-toothed tiger. So, so we'll just say a predatory cat. Two early humans are walking down the road and out of the bush jumps a predatory cat. Now, they can't outrun it. And one of them fighting alone probably can't fight it off, at least doesn't really have that good of a chance. But if the two of them stand together, they have a pretty good chance of fighting off the predatory cat. Okay, if I am inclined to think only of myself, I might take off running, hoping that the cat will just kill my, uh, my fellow early human who was left behind. You've probably heard the joke about the two hikers on the mountain road, out jumps a mountain lion, and the one says to the other, I'm putting on my running shoes. What are you putting on your running shoes for? We can't outrun a mountain lion. And the first one says, I don't have to outrun the mountain lion. I just have to outrun you. Which is actually not true because what's, what's a predatory cat or even a house cat has fixed or targeted what its prey is going to be it will run right past other potential prey in order to get that. They are stalk, stealth, ambush hunters, and uh, so they need to not be distracted. It's so one of the reasons why, just a little segue here, one of the reasons why your cat seems so aloof, um, neurologically, they've evolved to not be distracted because to not be distracted is uh, is essential for them as hunters in the, in the wild. And um, my dogs seem to be so social, they are social. They're pack hunters. They have to be keen to signals from other dogs in the pack, and they they hunt cooperatively. Now one one exception would be uh, would be lions who hunt in prides, and the, but uh, okay, you see, humans who are bonded to each other and would stick together could fight off predators that they couldn't fight off individually. Now, if one human runs and the other one becomes prey for the cat. The cat's going to realize this isn't my food of choice, but it's pretty easy to get. And there are more of them. And it's going to keep coming back. Pretty soon your entire group is going to be completely decimated. And you will not pass on your genes or your, or your social customs. It's the end. But if you are a group that is bonded to one another, you'll stand together. You will not abandon each other. You have far better chance of passing on your genes and your social customs. Okay, so this is one in one instance where having altruistic motives, caring about one another, will actually help us to survive as a group. Something else called the prisoner's dilemma.
two people are arrested in some dictatorial culture, and the police are interrogating them separately, trying to get confessions. Prisoner one is told, prisoner two's already confessed, you might as well give it up. Prisoner two is told, prisoner one's already confessed, you might as well give it up. In fact, neither has confessed yet. Now here's the deal. If neither prisoner confesses, if neither prisoner will rat out the other, there's not much the authorities can do. If prisoner one confesses, but prisoner two doesn't, Prisoner one's going to get off fairly lightly for cooperating. Prisoner two is, uh, is dog meat. Okay. And vice versa. If prisoner one holds fast, but prisoner two confesses, then prisoner two is going to get off light, with a light punishment, and prisoner one is going to be the one who gets totally nailed for this. If both the prisoners confess, they're both in trouble because neither confession is really crucial. So what do you do? Do you say, I don't trust my comrade to not rat me out? Or I'm gonna trust my comrade to not rat me out. If both prisoners will remain loyal to each other, Neither of them will confess, and they will both uh, walk free. Okay? Now, I would contend, this is called the prisoner's dilemma. Okay? And there, there are several different forms of it that might appear in various logic books, books on philosophy of action, books on ethics, whatever. Okay. I would contend that the only way you could plausibly believe your comrade will not rat out on you and that he could believe the same of you and thus avoid the worst possible outcome would be if you had already established a relationship of reciprocal trust before you were in that situation. A relationship that has been confirmed by your consistently reliable and trustable behavior with one another. If you've shown yourself to be inconstant, to be disloyal, to be a liar, to be only self-interested, if, if, you, if you think your, your comrade is only self-interested, you're going to assume, yeah, he's going to rat me out. It's only if you believe in altruistic, altruistic kinds, of, <laughs> kinds of relationships beforehand, before you're ever in that situation, that you would have the relationship of trust. So actually, this is an instance, as with the predatory cat, this is an instance where having altruistic motives eventually does act in your favor. Now remember, it's not the outcome of the action that determines whether it's altruistic or self-interested. It's the motive. It's why you do it. You may benefit from something that was altruistic. You may benefit yourself, do something altruistic and benefit yourself from doing it. That doesn't mean your motive wasn't altruistic. Okay. In Book One of Plato's Republic, Plato draws an allegory that the unjust person is like the charlatan, the just person like the, uh, like the craftsman, in just exactly this way. There are all these technical crafts that people practice. Civilization depends on them. A charlatan pretends to know what he's doing, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's only in it for himself. He's going to profit as much as he can, and he doesn't care who gets hurt in the process. A person who is not concerned about justice or fairness or virtuous behavior, who doesn't value friendship and reciprocity and so forth, is going to behave like the charlatan. I'm only in it for myself. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get ahead, and I don't care who it hurts. Whereas the craftsman, the person who has the technical knowledge necessary to actually practice the craft well, is going to benefit society, just as the person who is uh, concerned with being fair or just or reciprocal is going to benefit society. So in that sense, in that specific sense, the just man is like the craftsman and the unjust man is like the charlatan. 
Now, if you are motivated to be just and fair, and if you are motivated to be a craftsman, that is to care about the quality of your work, in both cases, you are benefiting society and the rising tide raises all, raises all boats. Okay, I just want to add on an end note, talk about, and again, we, we've mentioned this before, the difference between saying that something is obligatory, this is in your study guide, permissible or desirable. Obligatory means you have the duty to do it. You are violating some explicit duty if you do not do it. Permissible means there is no uh, defensible reason why you should be prohibited from doing it. Desirable means you can point to outcomes that are worth having if you, in fact, do it. Okay, and all three of these kinds of arguing may be, uh, all three of these ways of arguing may, in fact, be useful in ethical discourse. If you're going to tell me I have a duty that's obligatory, that I only care about myself, that's an awfully difficult case to make. If you're going to tell me that it's permissible for me to only care about myself as long as I follow my social contract, that's a case that might be easier to make, but still not necessarily without objections. If you're going to claim that it's desirable for me to act in my own interest, only in my own interest, selfishly in other words, then that is subject to all kinds of counterexamples and all kinds of counter evidence about why if you have people acting only out of selfish motives, you're going to end up with a situation where the most ruthless and the most unprincipled are in fact going to prevail over everyone else. Um, I mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again. Uh, William F. Buckley, who was uh, known as Mr. Conservative for many, many, many years, had a political commentary show on television called Firing Line. Um, he was hosting, this is back in the late 1960s, hosting the then presidential candidate of the Libertarian Party. And uh, the Libertarian candidate said, well, what we believe is that if everyone pursues their own self-interest, at the end of the day, everyone's interest will have been maximized. Buckley just leaned back in his, his best, most erudite Harvard accent, said, well, of course, we both know that's a composition fallacy, don't we? You remember the story now when I imitate his accent, right? Yeah, in other words, if I act only with regard for my own interest, and you act only with regard for your interest, and he acts only with regard for his interest, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. It does not follow that at the end of the day, everybody's interest is going to be maximized. What follows is that at the end of the day, those who are most aggressive, ruthless, and let's say unhampered by any concern for the welfare of others are going to prevail. If I am concerned for my own interests, but I also find myself bound by humanitarian restraints, saying, yes, I want to maximize my profits, but I won't do that by defrauding people. I won't do that at the cost of uh, unlimited cost of human misery. Then that's a whole different, a whole different scenario. Um, <clears throat> When we turn to Peter Singer now, I, I would contend that many people, many of uh, Singer's critics misunderstand that when he talks about the desirability of, then he talks about you know the ethical reasons for, say, that prosperous nations should give a certain part of what they now spend on luxuries to improve the standard of living in developing countries, or that uh, we have and an, we should feel ourselves ethically bound to such things as famine relief. Now what he's arguing for is the desirability of those policies. His critics usually say, well, you can't prove to me that I have a duty to do so. Well, it depends on how we define duty. <laughs> and it depends exactly on what social contracts we presume ourselves to have or not have. But certainly one can make the case that it's desirable. You might make the case that it's not desirable, but you know, those are the grounds on which we have to we have to make the argument. Okay, know what the, what outcome we're after. 
uh, How Are We to Live is the title of Singer's book. And really, the ancient Greeks said this is what? This is the most important question. Socrates said every other philosophical question is important only insofar as it helps to illuminate that question, how should we, how should we live? What is a good life and how do we achieve it? And that means we have to define what goods we are after and we have to look at what kinds of rules, institutions, and behaviors, and what kind of character development would expedite the optimal realization of those goods. Okay, looking at it in that way, it's very difficult to make the case that ethical egoism is superior to, uh, to let's say, its alternatives. What is really incredibly bizarre is that we see politically ethical egoism, people who are avowed ethical egoists, align themselves with conservative Christians in our own society, whereas in fact, the ethics taught by Jesus are completely contrary to those of, of ethical egoism. Well, singers coming up. <laughs>